Hi, my name is Pastor Andrew Tooney, and I would love to personally invite you to Hallelujah Side Baptist Church. We are a loving Christ-centered church located at 119 Valley Street in Old North Dayton. We are a local, independent Baptist body of Christ, taking the gospel to our beloved city of Dayton, whose sole purpose is to bring glory to God in all that we do, standing alone on our sole authority of faith and practice, the King James Bible. We have a children's and adult Sunday school hour that starts at 10 a.m. We have a sanctified worship service that starts at 11 a.m. Our midweek prayer meeting starts at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. We also have a nursery available for children 3 and under during both services. For more information, visit us at hsbc-dayton.com. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God bless you. be a shame to be at home sleeping somewhere, wouldn't it? It's good to be at church. Amen. Yep. Good to see everyone. You got your Bible with you? Absolutely. Did you bring your sword? Yeah. You can't go to battle without your sword. That's my lunch pail. Oh, I like that too. <laughs> got your lunch pail with you? <laughs> Scooby Dooby Doo. Did you say Scooby Dooby Doo when you used it? I, uh, amen. Well, we're going to continue on with the book of Matthew. So if you can, go to Matthew chapter number 23. Matthew chapter number 23. Starting in verse number 25. Jesus Christ speaking here. In his temple. And he says in verse number 25, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are, with, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye... Because you build the tombs of the prophets, and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them that killed the prophets. Fill ye up, then, the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? How this message is woe unto you, part three. Let's pray. Dear Father, we come before you, Lord, in the name of your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who purchased us with his own blood. And without him, Father, we have absolutely nothing. We are but sinful men, weak. We need you, Lord, this morning. Oh God, without you, we can do nothing. We can do nothing as individuals. We can do nothing as a church. I pray, God, that you open our eyes into the scriptures, that you teach us today, that you encourage hearts, and that if anybody is lost, whether it be here in this very room or wherever this message is broadcast, that you would save souls. I pray for other churches today that are biblical and sound in their faith and love you, and there's a pastor preaching the truth there today. I pray, God, that you use them. This country's in a wreck, Lord. And it's sin, and it's disgusting unto you. Help us, Lord, to be bold with the truth. Bold in your gospel. We love you. Be with your people. Comfort hearts. Heal the sick, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So Jesus Christ rode into his city through the eastern gate. 
As it says in Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 5, which is referring to Zechariah 9 and verse number 9, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. It was a few days before the Passover. I believe as Jesus Christ entered into the eastern gate riding on a donkey that it was the tenth of Nisan. The tenth of Nisan is the day in which they would bring the lamb before the priest that they would examine the lamb whether they could use them for the Passover. It must be a lamb without spot or without blemish. And this is when Jesus Christ entered into Jerusalem when he was going to be fulfilling the Passover by being killed and giving his life on the 14th. Of Nisan. Now remember when this is going on, when you're reading this portion of scripture, that Jerusalem itself and the city itself is packed full of people. I mean, it's, it's alive with people. There's probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, there traveling from all over to fulfill the Passover, which God ordained them to do. And as Jesus is entering into the, to, to, to Jerusalem through that eastern gate, there were thousands of thousands upon uh, thousands of Jews strawing their coats and palms in the way for the Lord Jesus Christ coming in. And as he was coming in, they were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Matthew 21 and verse number nine. They're singing this psalm. And the psalm that they're singing is Psalm 118, verses 21 through 26. This is what they're singing. And this verse that we, we oftentimes quote this verse. Uh, I think it's verse 26. It could be, but I'm not exactly sure. But it's, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Who's used that verse? And wh when do we use it? I'm not saying it's wrong. I mean, we use it for today. We wake up in the morning and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, that, that's good. That's good. That, that, that's, you know, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I am saying that that particular verse is referring to a particular day. And that particular day is when Jesus Christ rode in to Jerusalem on that day, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9. 9. And as we went through before, Daniel chapter number 9, the 70 weeks, he fulfills the 69 weeks. We're still looking for that other week. And that other week is not seven days, but it's seven years. That's the great tribulation. We're waiting for that. But this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. There's talking about Jesus Christ entering in, riding that donkey. Uh, and, they, and here's something really interesting. What, what did they say? They said, Hosanna to the son of David. This is really cool because that is the name Jesus Christ, if you break it down. Because if you say Hosanna, you know what you're saying? It means Lord save. That's what that means. Hosanna. What's Jesus' name mean? His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. And then to the son of David. What, what does that mean? He, it's, it's a prophetic name. It's a messianic title. That means he is the Messiah. He is the Christ. It is a title, not his last name, as it says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 16. And his name shall be called Jesus, and this is the one who you call the Christ. And so, Hosanna to the son of David, when you say that, you're saying Jesus Christ. I think it's really cool. Really cool. But as the multitude is saying this and singing as he's entering in, I mean, what a scene. What a scene. I've, I've been to some parades and, and they get excited, but it's usually because the magnificence of the parade. This is some guy that, as Pastor uh, Scott preached last week, there was, not, there was nothing uh, uh, miraculous or, or drawing about his physical appearance, riding on a donkey, and everybody was flipping out. What a, what a scene. As they were declaring and crying out, this is the Messiah, the King. You know what the Pharisees were doing? They were crying out too. You know what they were saying in Luke chapter 19, 39 through 40? They were crying out to Jesus because nobody else would listen to him. They tried to get Jesus to tell the people to be quiet. He says, tell them to shut up. I love Jesus' res response, don't you? I just love this. If, if, if these should uh, hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Amen. And I take that literal. I take it literal. If they would have been quiet, I, the, the stones would have made noise. That's what I believe. 
Absolutely. And see, listen to me. Nothing has changed as far as this goes in the world we're in today. The church, the pillar and ground of the truth, preaching the truth, preaching the gospel, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the world does? Shut up. Be quiet. We don't want to hear it. We preach against sin. We preach holiness. We preach Christ alone unto salvation. The world says, shut up. And the more, you know what's funny about, about the Christians? The louder the world gets, the louder we get. It's like encouragement. It's like the boos are encouragement. If you look at persecution, when, when Christians started to be killed, is when we started getting even louder. Well, this isn't working out. But man, I'm telling you, the world yells. That just, just keep yelling. That's encouragement to us. We must be on the right trail. But in our text, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is in the temple. And just to give you some uh, understanding about where we are and some things that recently happened in this time frame, is that Jesus just cleansed the temple recently for the second time. And he says about the temple that his temple... His house should not be called a den of thieves, but it should be a house of prayer. And he says that in Matthew 21 and verse number 12. He cursed the fig tree in Matthew 21 in verse number 19. He did this, I believe, as a picture of Israel. They had a lot of good religious works, a lot of leaves, but there was no fruit, no spiritual fruit. So he cursed the fig tree. He condemns Israel and the Pharisees at the same time in three parables in Matthew 21, 28 through Matthew 22 through 14. And then they, he, he, he's attacked in three different uh, instances with the, uh, fair, a guy, uh, the Herodians sent by the Pharisees. And he also has the Sadducees and a lawyer coming to try to trip the Lord Jesus Christ up in Matthew 22, 15 through 46. And he puts, to, he puts them all to silence, every single one of them. And now here we are in our text today in Matthew uh, 23, and we're starting here in verse 13 as we've been going through this unto verse number 33. And Jesus Christ, we see him as a judge. That's what he's doing here. Amen. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Jesus said in Matthew, or John chapter 5 and verse number 22 that all judgment is given unto the Son. Did you know that? Everybody in the world that has ever existed or will ever exist will be judged by Jesus Christ. Amen. Even the saints, we're, we're going to be judged by Jesus Christ. Not a judge under condemnation, but we're going to be judged by our works and whether he's going to reward us or burn up the things we've done for Christ. And the others that die in their sin, they're going to be judged by Jesus Christ, but it's under their condemnation. And this is what Jesus is doing here. He condemns them. Because he does a righteous judgment. He does not judge them according to how they looked. Because if you go by what we're reading here, Jesus makes it very clear that these guys were looking good. These guys had it all together. People thought by their looks that they were holy. But Jesus condemns them and judges them according to their hearts. And not only does he uh, condemn the scribes and the Pharisees, but he indirectly condemns Israel. Not only, listen to me, not only for their unbelief, but for giving God lip service. Amen. You see, if you're an atheist, God is going to condemn you for your unbelief. You're going to hell if you don't repent and all your sin. I mean, it's going to be on you. But listen, if you have unbelief in your heart and you do not love the Lord Jesus Christ and you come in and, and give him praise and lip service, you know, that's, that, that's putrefying to God. That is an abomination unto God. In Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 8, quoting uh, Isaiah, he says this, These people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor, honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He also says in Matthew 15, something that is one of the most scary things that you could ever hear. He, Jesus says this, Let them alone. Let them alone. That's the scariest thing Amen. God could ever say. Let them alone. And he, he, he goes on and says, They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Matthew 15 and verse number 14. But as we see in our text today, he says, Woe. 
Woe unto you. Woe, woe, woe. He says woe eight times in Matthew chapter number 23. And woe is a guttural sound of sorrow. And it's not for himself. It's for these men that are condemned. Amen. It's woe unto you. You're going to have judgment with no mercy. I want you to recognize something that's so very important. And I think you already know this. Jesus Christ does not have any happiness or any joy in sending anyone to hell. None. Zero. He does not rejoice in that. And we better not either. And sometimes in our flesh, that's hard to do. When a wicked man that's done wicked things goes to hell. Man, that's hard not to be joyous over that. Now, hold on. Let me backtrack just a half a second. I think we can have joy when the devil goes to hell. When he gets thrown in the lake of fire, I think we can, maybe, we can cheer on that one. I think, that, I think that, that's the exception. We can do that. But listen to me. He does not, re- he does, he's not have joy. He does not hap- have happiness. But God does receive glory. It's a righteous judgment. And I've heard this said before, and I, and I believe it. If you die without Christ and you go to the judgment seat and he brings before you every idle thought, every action you've ever done, listen to me. You will amen your own own death, your own damnation. You'll agree with it. You'll say, you are right. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, it says, Every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. He does still receive glory. Woe unto you. And as a Christian, as a, as a preacher, we, I, I believe this and I know this is very true. Listen to me. If you have breath in your lungs, there's still hope for you. Amen. In our finite understanding, limited. We are limited, man. Amen. I can't read your heart. I don't know what's going on with you. But all I can say is that if you have breath in your lungs and your heart still beating, there's hope for you. But in the eternal mind of God, there are others that have, that have no hope. And I believe that these are the men here. Amen. He is not giving them a chance for mercy, a chance for grace, but he is giving them judgment and condemnation. And he says in verse number 33, Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? This is not a statement saying, here, let me show you how you can escape the damnation of hell. He's saying, no matter what you do, you're on your way to hell. It's run out for you. And there's very good evidence of this because people ask this question all the time. Have I blasphemed the Holy Ghost? Have I done the the, the, the unpardonable sin? Well, if you read in the, is it Matthew 7? I don't know, I'll have to find it for you. But uh, I'll look it up for you later. But listen to me, the Pharisees, committed that sin because when jesus was casting out devils um they said he was doing this power which is the power of the holy spirit he was doing that by beelzebub in that same chapter he goes on and says hey if you blaspheme me it's forgiven you you blaspheme god it can be forgiven but if you blaspheme the holy ghost it will not be forgiven and these pharisees committed that very thing do i fully understand that no i don't but I know that it's true. Let me see if I can find that real quick. Just real quick, real quick. Mm-hmm. Just so you know where it is. Okay, here we go. It's uh, Matthew uh, 12, and you can read that today sometime, 22. Um, just read the whole chapter, or Matthew, Matthew uh, chapter number 12. But we see that Jesus rebukes them, condemns them, and judges them with eight woes. Eight woes in Matthew chapter 23, verses 13 through 29. Eight woes. And I was thinking about this, and there is a great contrast in Matthew chapter 5 when he preaches the Sermon on the Mount. There are nine ways to be blessed. And if you study these two things, I mean, there's many other things you could compare it to, but I can see... In these two contexts, these two scriptures, that there's one, that there's an there's a outward religion, but you're dead on the inside. And the other, the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount, is an inward relationship with God. 
Let's read those really quickly. Matthew chapter number 5. Huh? The laws. Oh, have you not read in the book? No, Matthew, no, Matthew 5, verse 1. We'll start there. Ready? Nope. Matthew 5, verse 1. He says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil uh, against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. As you see here, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they who mourn. Poor in spirit, mourn over your current condition. Mourn over your sin. He says meek. The word meek is to be broken. Broken like a horse. You know, you get a wild stallion. He's flipping around all over. That's you as a rebel. But once God saves you, he breaks you and you become obedient unto your master. That's what he's saying here. Broken. He says those who thirst and hunger after righteousness. What is the righteousness of God? It is Jesus Christ. You thirst and hunger after him. Merciful, you shall obtain mercy. And pure in heart. So important. Pure in heart. What does that word pure oftentimes mean? Without mixture. Pure. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strengths. And listen, if you're pure in heart... Your inside matches your outside. Amen. You're not a phony. You're not a fake. Your words match your actions. Pure in heart. Peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Who are the true peacemakers? The people who preach the gospel of, of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And a good evident token that you're changed on the inside, being born again, a child of God, is that the world hates you. That's what he says. The world hates you, and they hate you for his name's sake. And if you study these woes, it's the complete opposite. It's they're nice and shiny and looking good on the outward, but inward they're just wicked. They use, they're unmerciful. They use their position as Pharisees and scribes in this leadership to take advantage of the weak. They're self-righteous. They love the praise of men. That, that happens a lot in churches. People that come to church, people that go to church, people that preach behind the pulpit, I'm telling you, they do it for the praise of men, not for the praise of God. They do it for a popularity contest. They want people to... to, to uh, 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 Incur like say, oh, you're so, you're so wonderful. Look, at you went to church today. You got a tie on today, man. You're just so you're doing everything so great. And the pastor, the preacher, he wants to be famous. He wants the people to love him to tickle the ears of the people that he can lift up himself. Yeah. Absolutely, they were liars. They were proud. They were serpents and vipers. And I was thinking about this. Uh, part of the qualifications for a deacon is not to be double-tongued. You know who's double-tongued? A serpent. He's split-tongued. He's, he's sneaky. He's, he's sly. He says what you want to hear, but he doesn't really believe what he's saying to you. He's doing that to manipulate you. They twisted the scriptures. They lifted up the, the uh, traditions of men over the word of God. That's what these men would do. They were loved by the world. The, the, the Caesars loved these guys because they kept the peace. They kept Jerusalem at peace. And not only that, they vehemently hated the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, Jesus is bold, isn't he? 
We read in our text, he says, Woe unto you, you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, I wasn't there, but I can guarantee you it was quiet. And I guarantee you that voice of the Lord Jesus Christ would make you tremble. You see, to the people, the majority of the people, they looked at these men as holy men, as men that were teaching them the right things. But Jesus just straight up condemns them and reveals their heart, the core of who they are in front of everybody. Now, I might use the Pope here a little bit too much, but that's a good example. There are thousands, if not mil- hundreds of hundreds of thousands, I don't know, maybe millions, that worship the Pope. And he does this. He has different events. I don't know what, what it is, but he stands out on that balcony. Have you ever seen it? And everybody there thinks he's the vicar of Christ. Man, what if Jesus showed up and preached about his heart unto the whole people? It would be a shocker to everyone. A complete shocker. You hypocrites. What boldness. And I want to make sure you understand this. God doesn't want your empty religion. God doesn't want your lip service. God doesn't want your money. You know what he wants? He wants you. You need to understand that. He wants you. When God saved me, I cried out in my little Toyota pickup going down a road with with it raining like you wouldn't believe. I cried out to God and I said, All right, I'm yours. And from that time, God changed me. You see, there was many times before in my life that my life was all a wreck. And I would be like, Oh, everything's a mess. My life is a mess. It's all my fault going after the things I shouldn't be going after, living in sin, living like a dog. And I'm like, I'll I'll go to church. That's what I'll do. I'll start reading the Bible. That's what I'll do. And I did, half-heartedly. I gave half myself until things got better. Then I said, I don't need God. Go back to my vomit. Go back to my old life. You see, Jesus wants all of you. All of you. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross at Calvary, he didn't die halfway and give himself halfway, did he? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. We must worship God with a pure heart. A pure heart. We are bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. His his love for you is deeper than than any well you could ever imagine. You cannot understand the depth of His love for you. God does not want your words. He does not want your actions. He does not want your worship. It's all vain outside of Christ. You could give all your money to the poor. Listen to me. You can give it all to the poor. You can build houses for the homeless. You can donate your organs. That's some pretty extreme things, isn't it? Men will clap. But if you're doing that outside of Christ, it's nothing. I'm sorry to tell you, you've got to be in Christ. It has to be through Him and by Him. Because if if it's without Him, it's tainted by your sin. The sacrifice has to be perfect. And there's only one sacrifice that is perfect, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Give all! You know what really makes God sick? Lukewarmness. He said, I'd rather be cold or hot, but if you're lukewarm, he spews you out of his mouth. Look at Luke with me. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Luke 14. Luke 14, verse 26. It says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife 
and children and brethren and sister, yea, and his own life also. Put a square around this, a rectangle. He cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Look at verse 33. So likewise, whosoever, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. That's extreme. Amen. You know, in Matthew 7, it talks about the narrow way, doesn't it? And few there be that find it. I don't think we realize how narrow this way is oftentimes. He must have the preeminence in your life. Amen. Jesus Christ on the cross did not play games, did He? Hate not your father and your mother and your wife and your children and your brother and your sister, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You love Jesus so much that whatever anyone else says that's against Christ doesn't even affect you. Because you're going to do what God wants you to do. The, your, your wife or your kids say, Oh, just stay home from church today, please. I'm so this, I'm so that. we got to go to this thing. If you, if you come to my baseball game on Sunday, you must really love me. That didn't even affect me. Amen. It's Christ first. Christ first. It's so very important. It says in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is convicting to all of us. I don't care who you are. It's convicting to me. We must give all. Amen. Die to ourself. He cannot be my disciple. Man. In our text today, in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus calls them hypocrites seven times. Seven times. You can go through and underline them seven times from Matthew 23, 13 to 33. He calls them hypocrites. Hypocrites are an abomination unto God. But some here may be saying, and I, I, I hear you, I thought we're all hypocrites. Well, let me just give you a little bit of, maybe you say I'm splitting hairs. But there is, I believe there's a great difference between being hypocritical and being a hypocrite. Amen. You can kind of use them interchangeably, but I, I believe that it's, that it's very important to understand this because I'm hypocritical. I'm a sinner, I'm a man, I, I say things and I do something else. I'll proclaim, I'm on a low-carb diet! I'll be back there eating a donut later on. <laughs> but you said, and my kids call me out on, on stuff like that all the time. I'll be driving no seatbelt. Yeah, you told me to put a seatbelt on, Dad. Okay, you're right. Hypocritical, I'm hypocritical. But these guys weren't just hypocritical, as we all are. These were out-and-out -out hypocrites. From the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, they were liars. Amen. Their whole life was liars. Listen to this on the news I saw. Uh, the Washington Post, being woke now, says that George Washington, you know, he's a racist now, right? But he need, they need to change the name of George, uh, George Washington oh, University. But you know who said it? The Washington Post. Are you catching that? Hello, Washington Post. You're named after the same one you're saying that needs to be changed. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi and the gang, you know, you know what the, they did? They want to pass this big bill to help Ukraine. And they're saying that, hey, we need to protect their borders, protect their borders, protect their borders. If Ukraine doesn't have protection around their borders, they're in a lot of trouble. What about ours? Hypocritical. It's all over the place. But let's read our text really quickly. In our text, notice what's on the outside. And notice what Jesus reveals that's on the inside. In verse 25, we'll read this again. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within you are full of extortion and excess. 
Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so ye appear outwardly, uh, even so outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you. And so we see in these scriptures that they make clean the cup in the platter. Jesus is referring to the traditions of men that you can read in Matthew chapter number 15 where they are so concerned about the disciples washing their hands. They're so concerned about outward cleanliness because they think that that is what defiles them. But Jesus makes it very clear that it's what's on the inside that matters. And what was on the inside of these men? Extortion. Taking advantage of people, stealing from people, and not only stealing from people, but stealing from God. Amen. The tithes and the offerings and selling sacrifices for filthy lucre's sake. These men also were full of excess. What does that mean? No temperance. Giving themselves unto their lustful desires. They look holy, but when they get home, they're not holy. They, take, they may keep the robes on, I don't know. But listen, inside... Is full of wickedness, all uncleanness. Jesus said, you're like whited sepulchers. A sepulcher is a grave that's like a tomb, like outside. And the Jews would do this. I don't think they do this anymore. But before Passover, they would send guys out there to clean and to, to shine up the, the sepulchers. And they would do this way before Passover because if you did it close to Passover, you would be considered defiled. Because I think you're defiled seven days after touching the graves, and you could not partake in Passover. But they would make these sepulchers white and beautiful. The Pharisees, the scribes, what did they do? Remember the phylacteries? You remember learning about that? Where they had the box of the scriptures, they would make it really big on their head, really big on their left arm, and make everyone look that they're so concerned about pleasing and praying to God. And also they would make broad, uh, they would enlarge the borders of their garments. Now, if you remember that, you know the, the, the white uh, cloth, most, a lot of Jews wear underneath their clothing all the time, and they have the little tassels on each corner. I think it's in Numbers 15, I'm, I'm not 100%, but it's, it's a reminder to love God, serve God. And what did they do to make themselves look like they're so holy? They would make these things long and, and noticeable. Wow, look at this. But what did Jesus Christ say about what was inside of their bodies? Dead men's bones, spiritually dead, full, he says, of hypocrisy and iniquity. What did the people think about these men? It says in verse 28, it says once again, it says, Even so ye outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The people were fooled. The people were blind by their beauty, but not God. God is never fooled, but he judges men according to their hearts, according to what is inside you, according to who you truly love, not how many times you go to church, not how many times you pass out tracts, not how many times you, you give in the offering plate. Listen, those things are great when you're doing them out of a pure heart for God. Not to be seen of men and not to please other men. Very important. You see, these wicked men are not just liars. They are a lie. Through and through. A lie. What a terrible life. What a horrific way to live. To put on face. To pretend you're something that you're absolutely not. To take advantage of the people. They were out and out hypocrites. You know who they were just like? Their father. Turn to John with me. John chapter number 8. John chapter 8. They were just like their father. John chapter 8, starting in verse number 44. John chapter 8. In verse 44, listen to what he's talking to the Pharisees here. Listen, listen to what Jesus says. Take note. Ye are of your father, the devil. 
and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Wow. And abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of himself. He speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. How can you tell that the devil's lying? His mouth is moving. It says right there, there is no, absolutely no truth in him. None. Zero. None. Satan has no truth. Jesus Christ is nothing but the truth. Wow. So you see, the lie, if you will, is Satan. He is the lie from, he, from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He's a lie. And all his children and he himself, you know what they absolutely hate? The opposite. They hate the truth. They absolutely hate the truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. He is the truth. And they hate all his followers. Every one of them. Look back at our text and keep your finger in John real quick. Go back to our text in Matthew 24. Now look at this. Matthew 24 and verse number 29. Keep your finger in John 8. What did I say? 24, okay. 23. 23, I'm sorry. Starting in verse 29. It says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. Pay attention. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them that killed the prophets. Fill ye up the, then the measure of your fathers. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Very interesting. Jesus here is proclaiming that they're saying, look, Look, at, look how well we take care of their tombs, the prophets. If we were of, uh, of our fathers that killed the prophets, we would have no part in that. And as they were saying that they would have no part in the killing of the prophets, they already in their heart want to kill the prophet of prophets, Amen. the king of kings, the Lord of lords. I think that's what Jesus is saying here in verse number 32. Fill ye up the measure of your fathers. You're going to kill me. I'm going to let you kill me. Because it's a lot more than what you have an idea is going on here. But look at uh, John chapter 8. John chapter 8 in verse 37. John chapter 8 verse 37 says, I know that ye are Abra Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me. Because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen of my father, and ye do that which you have seen of your father, the devil. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto him, them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which, ha which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. So while they're even proclaiming, we wouldn't have killed the prophets. Yes, you would have. The reason why they killed the prophets is because the prophets spoke for God. They said the things that they didn't want to hear, that they were doing wrong, idol worship, all those other things. They got rid of the prophets because of that. The reason why they want to kill Jesus is to try to snuff out the truth. Ever since the truth was made flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Pharisees, wanted to kill and destroy the truth. Like I said, why did they want to destroy the truth? The word of God? Because they didn't want him to keep on revealing who they truly were. You see, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, he says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. You all are damned. You're wrong. You don't serve God. You serve your father who is the devil. 
revealing to not only themselves but to everyone who they truly are. Their answer to this predicament is not bowing to him because he is revealing the truth to them. Their, their answer to this question is get rid of him. Bury him. Get rid of the truth. You see, the world propagates and promotes lies to try to bury the truth. From the time the kids go into elementary school, they teach them truth is relative. There are no absolute truths. They teach them evolution. What's that really teaching them? There is no God. The Bible is fallible. It's not the word of God. It's written by men. If that be true, there's no heaven. There's no hell. They try to bury the truth under, under lies. Who's, who's, who's involved in all this? The God of this world. You know what's so wicked? I looked this up. I'm not going to sing it to you. But I think this really gives a great example of the devil. And his lies that he pushes upon the world. And how he propagates it. How he promotes it. If you ask majority of people, older people, do you love the Beatles? A lot of them would say, oh yeah, I love the Beatles. Well, maybe this is after the Beatles. Maybe this is John Lennon. But listen to this song, Imagine. This is straight out of the pits of hell. I'm telling you. And listen to me. I like the song. I like the melody. That's the whole purpose. The devil always wants you to like the melody. He always wants to swoon you. Listen to what it says. Imagine there's no heaven. That's how it starts out. Wow. And people just sing along. Even Christians sing along with it. Oh, this is great. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. Who is that speaking there? Antichrist, no doubt about it. It, is it, it isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us in hell and the, the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger, a brotherhood of man. Imagine all, all the people sharing the world. You may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will live as one. The average person, they don't think that song's evil at all. I don't either. I mean, I it's absolutely 100% evil. There's no heaven. There's no hell. Live for today. Go to hell with a smile upon your face. That is a message from Satan himself. Man alive. And I'm telling you, on the highway to hell isn't as good as, as a wicked song as that. But see, the answer the, the, the world has is Jesus, the church, and this book is the problem. Get rid of the book. Get rid of the well, No, we, we like these other churches that preach prosperity and allow the homosexual crowd in and look just like the world. We love those guys. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. But churches that stand upon the word of God that preach this book, I'm telling you, their answer is get rid of the book. Get rid of the people. Get rid of the church. They're our problem. We don't need them. We don't want God. We want our sin. Kill the truth. You can be free if we just kill the truth. You see, the mob in the world has already spoken, haven't they? Happened about 2,000 years ago when the truth stood before them. And you know what the response of the world was? Crucify him. That's still the chant of the world. Crucify him. Crucify him. You know who we want? We want Barabbas. We want that seditioner, the man that was a robber, the man that's a murderer. We can identify with him. That man that's innocent, we can't identify with that guy. Get rid of him. Amen. You know, the truth allowed the lie to kill him. 
to prove that everything he said and everything he did and who he was, that he is the son of God, that he is the son of man, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is the savior, that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, that he is the great I am, that he is God almighty, that he is eternally true. He let the lie kill him, but three days later, he rose. You can't kill the truth. You can't kill the truth. The truth is unstoppable. The truth will make you free. The truth is all-powerful. The truth, who is Jesus Christ, will liberate you. Cut you free from sin. Cut you free from this world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. And the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Ephesians 4 21 at the end it says, As the truth is in Jesus. You see, we, Hallelujah Side Baptist Church, we are the church of the living God. It's not about numbers, it's about truth. We are the pillar and the ground of the truth. And you know what's so exciting? I know you've heard it here how many times. But you need to hear it again. I want to hear it again. That Jesus Christ said upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not, shall not, shall not prevail against it. Will not. Ain't going to happen. And what's that verse saying? It's saying that the church is on the offense. The truth can't fail. You can't kill the truth. You can't snuff the church out. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. Amen. You know what's so awesome? We're on the offensive, but you know where we're fighting from? We're fighting from victory. You've got to love that. No matter what you're going through today, listen to me, you're fighting as a Christian from victory. Amen. No matter what's going on. Man, is, is that encouraging or what? I don't know if DVR players even exist anymore. But they have DVR. They watch, people would watch the end of the game and go watch the rest of it. And if the team won at the end, the whole game's really enjoyable because you know what's going to happen. And if you know the team lost, you're like, I don't even want to watch it. Forget it. We win. The truth wins. The truth will make you free. You see, the world and Satan hates the truth, hates Jesus Christ, and hates his church. In a really telling text, and you can study this sometime, it's Revelation 20 and verse 8. Don't go there. But Revelation 20 and verse 8, this is after the millennial kingdom. Jesus Christ rules and reigns here on this earth for a thousand years with a rod of iron. It's, it's a tremendous time. There's no wars. It's peaceful. It's, 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 everything is just, people are living super old. Uh, there's no violence. There's, there's animals. What does it say? The, the lamb is laying with the wolf. These things happen. But at the end, Satan is loose, and he goes, and he does what he's doing right now. He deceives the nations. And what happens? Gog and Magog go to fight the Lord Jesus Christ. Cuckoo. But that's what men want to do. They still want to do it today. So I got a question for you. Go to math or John chapter 15 and we're done. John chapter 15. Just got a question for you and whoever's listening. John 15 verse number 18. John 15 verse number 18. Says this, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. So a simple question that you need to ask yourself. Does the world hate you? Because we see that in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 12, it says, All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
Now we live in a we live in a green tree, right? Meaning that we still have freedom and we can go preach in the streets and our persecution is super light. But even now, if you're a Christian and you live as a Christian, you are godly on the inside and from the inside, you're godly on the outside. If you live that way before men and you tell others about Christ, you will suffer persecution. It, it's going to be very, very, very light. But you will. And if you're not suffering any persecution as a Christian right now, something ain't right. Something ain't right. If you walk out of church and say, man, the world loves me, then I come to church and everybody loves me. But out there, I laugh at the dirty jokes and smoke what they smoke and drink what they drink and watch what they watch and they just love me being around because my presence doesn't bring any conviction whatsoever. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost lives within you. And I'm telling you, conviction will happen if you are godly. Amen. You'll walk in a room and they'll wish that you weren't there. Because they're like, oh man, they know what you stand for. My mom, she used, to, she used to come in when I was a teenager. And I'd be watching something I shouldn't be watching on TV. When she would walk in, man, that channel changer would go quickly to something else. Her presence would bring conviction in my life. I knew what she stood for. That's the way it should be as a Christian. You should not be a chameleon. Amen. So be real. Hi, my name is Pastor Andrew Tooney, and I would love to personally invite you to Hallelujah Side Baptist Church. We are a loving Christ-centered church located at 119 Valley Street in Old North Dayton. We are a local, independent, Baptist body of Christ, taking the gospel to our beloved city of Dayton, whose sole purpose is to bring glory to God in all that we do, standing alone on our sole authority of faith and practice, the King James Bible. We have a children's and adult Sunday school hour that starts at 10 a.m. We have a sanctified worship service that starts at 11 a.m. Our midweek prayer meeting starts at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evening. We also have a nursery available for children three and under during both services. For more information, visit us at hsbc-dayton.com. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. God bless you.